Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, what are you doing? You're listening to the Stephen Round Show. Congratulations, you have chose wisely in life. But at episode number nine, how did that happen? I have no idea. It just seems like a few months ago my friend said, hey, you should do a podcast show, and I thought, well, yeah, why not? I listened to enough of them. We're going to get to show in a minute, but as per usual, just listen to the adverts and then we'll get on to it. So, hope you're having fun. As always, like, share retweet, subscribe, all the usual stuff. You can follow me on Instagram. Not that I'm particularly into that. Look at me, look at me. You can follow me on SoundCloud. Uh, please leave a comment on iTunes. It'd really help out. And at least I would know you're enjoying it. Anyway, have a great weekend and enjoy the show. Cheers, bye-bye. Have you had enough of nondescript gym clothes that are poor quality and look boring? Well, look no further. Legacy Gym Apparel brings you contemporary designs with functional performance in mind so that you can look great in or out of the gym. They have clothing for girls and guys. Head over to LegacyGymApparel.com. The company is run and owned by Brian Lewis. Brian has a wealth of experience in the health and fitness scene. He wanted to create something exciting and hard-wearing. Well, Brian, mission accomplished. Let me tell you, if you're looking to put your clothing through some serious pressure, then Legacy Gym Apparel is a clothing line for you. Nothing is indestructible, but this stuff comes pretty close. So have a look at the website, choose some gear and use a discount code FB20. LegacyGymApparel.com Anyone who's ever played a team sport knows the hassle that comes with being the organiser and having to find players every week. We've all been there, boiling with frustration knowing you need to find a player. From football to tennis, golf to badminton, athletics to cricket. Find a player takes a hassle out of organising the sport that should be your escape from the stress of everyday life. Find the player allows users to create a profile listing the sports they're interested in playing, their day-to-day availability, their skill level and the area they cover. The app then matches games and events looking for individuals with users that fit their profile. It's perfect for people new to an area looking to get into the sport. Whatever sport or game you're into, the app gives you the tools to find other individuals and teams who share your interest. Find the players available to download free now from the iTunes or Android store. For more information, visit www.findaplayer.com. So get up, get involved, and get into it. Are you looking for something a bit different, something tasty? Grunt and Growler is an amazing craft beer shop located in the hippest part of the UK. Grunt and Growler is a craft beer off-licence that sells a rocking selection of draft beers to take home. If you want to get the best craft beer, then head down to Grunt and Growler, located in 51 Old Dumbarton Road, York Hill, Glasgow. When you arrive at the shop, you'll be greeted by some of the most informative and enthusiastic staff. And let me tell you, they love beer. So hop down to the store and have a look at what they have to offer. In addition to the draft beer, they also have an amazing selection of craft bottled beers. But the growler is where it's at. Sample some of the delicious draft and tap. Buy a growler. Get it filled up with delicious draft beer that you've chosen. Go back to your house or someone else's and enjoy that delicious beer. So remember, don't get a howler, take home a growler. Gruntinggrowler.com Hello. When I started the Stephen Rowan Show, I wanted to share people's lives and share some of their stories. The remit was simple. Find interesting subjects that are travelling along a road less travelled or fighting through adversity. Simply put, I wanted to find those that are living a life less ordinary. And let me tell you, tonight's guest is the epitome of that. The Scottish film director, the Scottish film writer, the Scottish film producer. I could go on and on, but there really is only one May Miles Thomas. So join us in this conversation where we discuss work, life, film, TV, the future of Scottish film industry and some really big surprises. If you've not experienced their work, you really should. Have a look at Elemental Films, the website where you can see a large body of her work. And I have to ask, if you've not heard of her, what have you been doing with your life? Where have you been living? Under a rock? May is compelling and she's forthright. We need more people like May. And I'm not just talking about in the film industry. We need someone that pushes the boundaries and elevates the arts. The whole experience for me was not only educational, but inspiring and ask that you please listen to them because there's a special message for you. So sit back, relax, and listen to a true artist express themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me. 
Welcome to the show, me, Miles Thomas. Oh, hello. Thanks for having me. Okay, May, we're going to start off by going a bit back in time. What is your earliest memory of going to the cinema? Oh, that's going back into ancient history, I think. <laughs> uh, my earliest memory of cinema was, I must have been about three, and I remember going to a place called the Corky, which was also known as the Argowan, which was a cinema in Tradeson. And I went along with my granny. I remember my granny taking me. And the film that we saw was the Marx Brothers Duck Soup, which did its first run, I subsequently learned, in 1933. But this was in the 1960s. And I'm thinking, an American film washed up in Glasgow. What's all that about? But I loved it. I just loved the whole thing. And when people talk about the Corky, I've looked up various websites about, you know, Glasgow cinemas and the, the history of them. And the Argowan, which was like one of, I don't know how many cinemas, there were tens, scores of them in the city, but this seated 1,400 people. So you're thinking this wee tiny cinema actually sat 1,400 people and there were loads of them all over the inner city, and I remember going to several. I'd go to the Lyceum in Govan, there was one called the Lawn, which was in not in Lawn Street, but in Cornwall Street in Kennan Park, where I grew up. So I so that was my earliest memory. And what kind of effect did cinema have on you when you were growing up? When I was growing up, well, I suppose most people would say it was a form of escape, and it certainly was for us, because I grew up in some of the... Um, the less salubrious parts of the city and I because uh, I grew up in a rooming kitchen in a place called Sleed Street in Kennan Park and so for us as a family to get to the cinema was like going to a palace you go somewhere where it had nice carpets on the floors and beautiful lighting and uh, you know polished wood and the, and the little kiosks with the lovely lights and the sweets on display and you're just thinking this is incredible and then you get the main event which was the films themselves. So I, I loved it. I just loved everything about it. And was it a big thing for you that you discussed after the film or your friends and your family? I don't really remember anything that that explicit. It was just that sense of you would come out on a high. I always remember coming out of cinemas thinking, I wish I had that life or I could be that person. So uh, that's the, that's the impression I had of visiting cinema. My grandmother used to take me to like big event pictures. Like I remember going to the uh, Odeon Cinema in Renfield Street to see Barbara Streisand and Funny Girl, or The Sound of Music at the time. And these big tentpole movies, I would you know you'd come out in a real high and dancing down the street. And of course now you're a writer, you're a producer, you're a director. You've got your own production company. And you've you've got a you've got so many awards. A few. <laughs> so, what is the hardest part of your job? At the moment, the way the work that I do has evolved over the years is because I've done various things. Um, I, I started actually in theatre, in a, many many years ago, and I was working as a set designer for a couple of companies. Uh, they were basically on a voluntary basis and I moved from there to television and I moved from television into doing music videos and commercials and then I moved from there and it took a long time because my ambition was always to try to do drama to move into some kind of narrative form and that was the hardest thing that I had, you know, making that leap from all of this other stuff into making narrative feature films. That was always the dream was to make. I never bothered about shorts, funnily enough, because I reckoned that the experience I'd gained from doing short-form commercial work was sufficient. I didn't feel that I had to prove myself, probably a wee bit arrogantly, because I mean, I was writing short scripts. I, I wrote loads of short scripts, but that was a way of practising, and like everybody else applied for every single scheme that was going, whether it was Tartan Shorts or uh, one of the British uh, screen, they had, had annual short films, BBC, but there were other schemes, 10 by 10s, and you'd apply for all of these. And I remember one of the first short scripts I wrote was shortlisted for Tartan Shorts, which was a great film scheme because the budgets at the time 
were huge. I mean, it was like 30,000, and that was like back in the day. So that was a lot of money. And the, I, I guess the express wish of the people behind that scheme was to try to make people make the transition from doing shorts into feature films. So you had the likes of Peter Mullen, who did the tr made the transition, and Peter Capaldi as well, who's a contemporary of mine from Glasgow School of Art. So, you know, so that was a route to it. But personally, I never really fussed that much. I would get to the wire and go, oh. So after serial rejection, I got to a point where I thought, if I'm going to make this much effort, I might as well be writing longer form work. And that's where I started to write, you know, full length feature screenplays, or at least try to. Um, and it was just a, a good way of practicing my writing and hopefully getting better at it. So you're obviously involved in many different disciplines within the film industry. How do you deal when you're going into a project and you're going to be directing, producing, writing, as well as dealing with, you know, all the post-production stuff? That's um, well, that's a more recent thing. Uh, I mean, it's it's quite quite complex issue to talk about. How do you approach your work? Um, because you start off thinking, well, that's a job I'd like to do, and. If I'm really honest about it, this kind of happened by accident. My background was in design. I went to Glasgow School of Art and uh, did a degree in what was, uh, well, it was printed textiles, but it was a course that allowed a lot of latitude in the form of work that you did. And my work was getting more sculptural and it was getting much larger in scale. So it was a kind of no-brainer for me to evolve it into doing a stage design. And at one point, I seriously contemplated going to London and I went down and had a look at the courses at the Royal College and at the Slade. And the Slade were doing a two-year postgrad theatre design course, which I seriously thought about doing. Um, but then I got the opportunity to work with a drama group from Glasgow University. And I thought, I could be doing this for real, not just making maquettes. Um, I could actually be trying to design and you know, when you're young and daft, that's, he's like, I can do this, I can do this, no problem. And But I did, and I threw myself into it. So, um, so it started off as a designer, and I parlayed that into a job at BBC Television in London, where I went down initially for three months. I was filling in for people who were in summer holiday, and I eventually got a permanent job there. Got really lucky, got a permanent job, and eventually got promoted through that and then made this quite strange sideways career move into production where I became a producer and director of music and arts documentaries. Fantastic break. I was so lucky. You then moved into making your film One Life Stand. How did it feel to express yourself on your own terms? Well, again, that was a sort of hard one thing. Um, I tried for a long time, as I said before, to try to get a short drama made, and I never quite succeeded. Ironically, the the only success that I've had um, with my partner, now my husband Owen, was a script that I wrote called The Beauty of the Common Tool, which we were awarded funding for. From um, It was another Scottish screen scheme. Um, it was a thing called Prime Cuts, and it was in association with British Screen. And I'd written the script and I'd nominated my husband to be the director on this. And so the film got made, and but without telling us, Scottish Green submitted it to Palm Springs International Short Film Festival. And we won uh, the top prize, which is, I think it's a, you know, a fair achievement given that it's one of the largest short film festivals in the world. And 800 films, I think, we get. And this was quite a bizarre wee film because it was, you know, gla from Glasgow, black and white, you know, quite a strange wee story about an old man going to buy a tool from a tool store and he encounters this young guy at the start of his working life who doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. <laughs> it was just a very odd thing. But um, I later learned from the people at Palm Springs that the reason they chose it as the winner was because it wasn't trying to ape Quentin Tarantino because they went through a phase where everybody was trying to do Tarantino-type films, but uh, this thing just stood out for that reason. So there's a, the, I guess there's a lesson in that, that you should just go with your gut and don't try and follow the trends. Be yourself. 
Um, but the, well, <laughs> the, the the irony in that was there I was trying to sort of get together a career as a writer and director of feature films. And the one thing that, you know, I gave to my husband, he ends up directing it, it ends up winning a prize. It was shortlisted for an Oscar nomination in the live action category, which was just crazy. I'm so glad that we never got the nomination because I was up to Heido just looking to see whether or not we would get the nomination. What would it have been like if you had? I would have died, I think. But... uh, so in terms of career, I'm trying to get back to the nub of your question uh, about uh, this idea of multitasking. Frankly, there wasn't anybody that I knew, because um, I'd lived in London for a long time, and when I returned to Glasgow, obviously there was a bit, well, quite an established sort of film crew, you know, film industry, for want of a better word, based here. But I never knew any of the people who were involved. I knew some of the people, like, um, you know, cinematographers or one or two editors, but I never really knew anybody who worked on the production side of it. And so for that reason, and also to provide a legal entity to access funding, I formed a production company in 1995, which I called Elemental Films. And I named it after, I'd written a quartet of stories which I'd called the Elemental Quartet. And it was, it sounds a bit hippy-dippy, but they were, it was based, these stories were based on themes of air and earth and fire and water. And so the company took its name from this quartet of stories that I had written that I was trying to develop in, into, um, you know, scripts of some, some kind. And so having formed the company, it immediately put me in the position of having to be a producer to try to go and source the money or source the projects. But I never let go of my own ambition, which was really just to be a writer and director. Because I'd always written, I've been writing since I was about five years old, whether it's wee stories or poems or drawing my own comics or short scripts, treatments, whatever. So, uh, So that was always the plan, was one day I would get to direct something. But having applied for all of these schemes, like everybody else does, and these schemes, and I don't even know that there's so many of them now or that they're so wide-ranging in the kind of people they're trying to attract to them. But, what I, you know, I'd given up on that and I thought, I'll keep doing commercial work because at least the commercial work can fund the period where I'm writing, where I'm trying to just get better at the craft of writing. And I signed up for a couple of courses and... You're trying to do the right thing to get better, but the only way to get better is just to sit and do it. The old advice is still true. Um, It was Oliver Stone's father said, writing is arse plus seat. And I'm a great believer in that. (laughs) And that's what I did. I just sat and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote until I thought, ah, I know what I'm doing now. So you've learnt a lot of disciplines over the time. Yeah, so writing, certainly. Um, But it wasn't really taking me anywhere. I, I just think that... In the context of a Scottish film industry, I think it's we've got a really, really hard time here trying to break through as filmmakers. Anybody who writes, directs, produces will tell you the difficulty in trying to raise the finance to get anything made. It's it's just so, so hard. And we I think in Scotland we're uniquely disadvantaged because you've got a situation where people here, by necessity, have to look to London to finance project, be that through a broadcasting partnership, public funding, private finance, you know, whatever the patchwork of money is needed to make the film. But generally, you have to go to London. If you're looking for distribution, you have to go to London. If you're looking for a sales agent, the business is all in London. We don't really have that business here. And I've often compared it to, you know, me being in Copenhagen, but having to go to Stockholm in order to get my film made. And the difficulty that you have with that is, I wouldn't say, you know, you can't say that, oh, everything's all stitched up or you have to be posh or you have to come from money, you have to have an independent income in order to succeed as a filmmaker. I think if you really, really want to do it, there's ways to do it. But what you have to do is drop the excellent models of filmmaking 
where you have to have X number of cast, X number of crew, depending. I mean, how many films have I seen that are essentially two guys in a room, but they've got six assistant directors, costume designer, production designer, production manager, this whole hierarchy of roles and both technical and craft and production that take to make a film that involves two guys in the room. And for me, that doesn't make sense. So having had lots of knockbacks over the years, probably, I think I counted 26 knockbacks for various film schemes. <laughs> you think I would have given up by then? <laughs> Take a hint, me. Uh, I thought, no, there's got to be another way of doing this. And I got quite frustrated. And so I thought, how can I get out of Scotland? Because I thought being here is it's got to be holding me back. All the objective evidence would tell you don't be based here because it's just too difficult. Scotland's great as a location. And, I mean, maybe later on we'll come on to what I think the landscape is like for filmmakers at the moment. And it's interesting to reflect on that. But what I did was, I got so fed up, I applied for a fellowship in, in Germany at a thing called the NIPCO programme, which was a scheme set up for media professionals. It was based in Berlin. And to my astonishment, um, and without any drama on my showreel, I submitted a commercials reel and they accepted me in the back of my commercials reel. And so I got myself out to Berlin and what was also really uh, fortunate was that my husband landed a job as a design engineer because as a filmmaker, he is sensible and he's got a day job. So we both went to Berlin and um, it allowed me the space and the time to research and to write a screenplay which was eventually optioned by a Berlin-based production company. Um, and that was the start of a journey because being Scottish and coming from here and coming from, um, you know, there is a system of public funding here for film. My producer in Berlin asked if I would be prepared to approach Scottish Green, who were the body at that time charged with dispersing public money for film. Um, would I, you know, submit to get some development funding from them? Which is fair enough, you know, because half the film that I'd written, half the script I'd written was set in, in the west coast of Scotland. And I said, sure. And I'd, I'd set up a meeting with the then head of development, who, to spare his blushes, will remain nameless. And I'd sent a script probably eight weeks in advance of me coming from Berlin to Glasgow to discuss the possibility of getting some you know, um, development money to develop the project, to develop the script up and to find other backers for it. And having phoned and sent uh, faxes, that's how long ago it was, faxing the guy, emails, I'm coming to Glasgow, I'm coming to Glasgow, let's do this meeting and I arrive and the guy's 20 minutes late for the meeting, which is no great, but I'm thinking, OK, let's have the meeting. It gets worse, because the guy then turns around and says, um, I haven't read your script. And this is like eight weeks since I've sent the script. So you can imagine having made that trip from Berlin to Glasgow to discover that the guy's not read the script. You know, to say that I was just a little bit put out would be a, an understatement. It actually, he did me a great favour because it made me, it made me realise that it was so hopeless. I'm gonna have to find another way of doing this, instead of going down the usual route of finding a bit of development money and trying to parlay that into production finance, whether it's public, private, whatever. I thought there's got to be another, another structure for getting a film made. How do you do it? I returned to Berlin and shortly after that ill-fated meeting, um, I was invited on a thing called Arista, which was a story editors and um, basically a writers and story editors workshop. It's quite an intense thing. It ran for a week and it was based, um, when I did it, I was in Hamburg for a week. So I went to Hamburg, met lots of really interesting people doing all kinds of diverse projects and thinking all the time, how am I ever going to crack this? I had a script which was with a Berlin-based producer for which I could not raise any money for, it seemed, in Scotland where half of the story was based. What, what was I going to do? Um, so I did the week in Hamburg, went back to Berlin 
and I decided then and there, right, I'm going to write this script um, and I'm going to go back to Scotland and I'm going to shoot it. And it's got quite an interesting story, the, the backstory to One Life Stand, because how it happened was a mate of mine um, was doing a review programme for BBC Scotland. It was an arts review thing, and he'd been given a copy of Pasolini's film, Mamma Roma, which had just been remastered. And he said, you should have a look at this, mate. It's a really great film. And I knew a Pasolini, but I hadn't seen this film. So I watched it and I thought, you know what? This film could be set in Glasgow. It really could. And it was a, a story of a mother and a son. And it was quite a simple story. A lot of it shot in the streets. And I'm thinking, but this could be Glasgow. So I started looking into Italian neorealist films and thought, we're missing a trick here. You could do this stuff. So I'm back in Berlin. I write the first draft script in four weeks and it pretty much wrote itself after being armed with all of this stuff and enthusiasm after doing the Arista workshop. I thought, good. Now, now I've got a script that is doable, it's makeable. I'm not going to need you know, a six-figure sum, a seven-figure sum to make it. This thing could be done basically in a few houses in a couple of locations, just with the right people and just with the right number of crew. And so that was the starting point for, for that film. It was deciding there had to be another way of doing it. How did you feel about taking that leap and you know, perhaps going against your contemporaries or the, the current system? Well, what I was seeing is was that not many of my contemporaries were even getting the chance to make anything, unfortunately. There were so few films, and I think it's still the case that the level of Indigenous production in Scotland is so low, it's, it's almost negligible. You're lucky if you maybe get four, five, six films a year coming out of Scotland, even now, when you compare it to the likes of Scandinavian countries. But there are very different reasons why they are quite successful because they've got broadcaster, um, you know, broadcaster support. They're, you know, they're very status in the way that they they fund things, and and also to the great advantage of Scandinavian countries is they've got their own language. We're at a disadvantage because we've got English, but it's but it's the wrong kind of English, if you see what I mean. Um, it's quite common for films made in Scotland to be put in front of exhibitors in London who have to make the decision, do we put this into cinemas? And quite often, London exhibitors will say, well, we're going to have to subtitle this or nobody's going to get this. And so that does put us at a disadvantage. And I just, I just think, um, from a producer's point of view, it does take such a long time if you're trying to develop a project within the conventional film industry. You're talking years, you're talking anything from three, five, seven. There was one guy who told me that he'd spent 13 years trying to get even just the most modest amount of finance for his film. You know, people can starve in that time. It's so difficult. You got it. You know, we've all got lives. We've got you know rent to pay. We've got bills to pay. We've got to eat. How do you sustain yourself as a producer when it is that difficult? So I think, in a way, the model's broken. And even if you get to the point where you get into production, you have to overcome that hurdle about getting it into distribution. And even when you get it into distribution, the there's no meaningful distribution for low-budget movies, which are generally the only kind of movies that get made in this country that are indigenous. You know, if you've got... It used to be that four million was a reasonable low-budget film. Well, now you're lucky if 500,000... <laughs> you get 500,000 to make a movie with. So it's... it's The landscape is quite tricksy, but um, I think there are still enough people out there with the determination to make it. I just wanted to try to invent a better mousetrap for myself in order to get a film made. And that takes us back to the experience in One Life Stand, where for a, a low five-figure sum, I think our total budget on it eventually was £34,850. Um, but for that, we, we did have a crew of, of sorts. It was a kind of step up from what you'd regard as a normal documentary crew. 
and we had a cast, we had a fairly sizable cast in that as well. And uh, I was responsible for all the post-production, you know, because we found methods, we found different way of shooting it using three chip camcorders, different way of editing using you know, PC-based NLE systems and proper software for the first time. So a lot of things coincided with me deciding to make that film. The technology was available, we had just enough money to do it with, and I had people who were willing, you know, co-conspirators on it, who really wanted to see something get made. And, and so that's, you know, that's how we, we approached it. We had very few locations, you know, a smallish cast, small crew, you know, and I think it served as a really good model. In fact, it was used as a model, um, uh, probably off the back of it getting attention and winning awards and getting good uh, good critical response. Uh, I was then invited by the likes of Film London and the Irish Film Board to talk about how we had achieved it. I mean, our budget was probably far too low, but I'd never tapped any into any public funds. And, I mean, this was purely self-financed, but it served as quite a good model for that type of low-budget filmmaking. It just proved that it could be done. And then from a, there you moved on to Solid Air, another wonderful film. Thank you. Highly enjoyable, and if you've not seen it, ladies and gentlemen, find a copy, or hopefully there will be an anniversary screen, but keep your fingers crossed for that one. So you moved on to Solid Air, and what, what kind of uh, tools or experiences did you, did you take from that and move on? Well, as a result of One Life Stand, I mean, it's a matter of record that it, it got some great reviews, and I went on to win lots of awards. I won, well, I didn't win, but the film won uh, the Biffa Award, uh, well, Biffa, um, for Best Achievement in Production. Uh, the Scottish BAFTA Awards, they, they were New Talent Awards. It won Best Writer, Best Director, Best Film. Uh, Maureen Carr, who is the lead in it, won Best Actress. I won... Uh, what else did I win? I got a commendation for Michael Powell Award at the Edinburgh Film Festival for Best New British Feature. We won uh, an award in New York, uh, a little festival called Silicon Valley. We won Best Picture at that, which got me out to Los Angeles, which is a whole other story. So going off the success of that, and, and plus the reviews were great, for a film that never actually achieved a release, the response to purely through the festival circuit was really, really encouraging. And so having that and, you know, and everything that came off the back of that, because we never made it as a commercial film, that's actually quite important point for me to make, was mm -hmm. it was never a commercial proposition. I was purely making this film as a calling card for myself, as a writer and director, even though I took on the roles of doing you know, cinematography and editing and various other jobs along the line. But principally, it was for me to showcase myself as a writer and director. Um, and off the back of that, one of the prizes that I did win was I won the first ever Scottish Screen Outstanding Achievement Award, which I think everybody you know around me, my peers, thought was a bit of an apology because I'd decided quite deliberately not to approach public funders, given my experience with my Berlin project. And so... The money that came with that award I used towards uh, the development of a project called Solid Air, which you just mentioned, which became my second feature film. And ironically, the big mistake I think that we made in trying to make that film, when I say we, I mean me and my partner Owen, was we tried to do everything right. We tried to be grown-up filmmakers and engage with the industry and engage with distributors at an early stage and to source finance you know, from various other sources, but principally the public source. Um, we never sought broadcaster money, but broad broadcasters came in eventually. So you obviously learnt a huge amount uh, from making One Life Stand. What did you take on to Solid Air? Well, I don't think there were too many lessons from One Life Stand uh, that we could really... You know, we could really transfer on the making of Solid Air. I'd already written a script, um, an early draft of Solid Air, while I was still working on the first film. And the opportunity was there for us to, you know, just progress a bit 
and probably try to, for want of a better word, professionalise ourselves um, by, you know, taking the opposite approach from the DIY route, which is, you know, we had to embrace the very conventional industry that we wanted to be part of, which meant we had to, you know, like go into development and how that normally works in this country is with a public funder, they will, you know, they'll, they'll fund the writing of the script to, you get to the draft to a state where it can be packaged and presented, you know, it allows you the freedom to go off and uh, try to raise, you know, production finance or at least form the relationships that can lead to production finance or to secure distribution, all of that stuff, which was something that we never engaged with in One Life Stand because One Life Stand had never been made as a commercial um, proposition. It, it was purely a calling card for me to demonstrate that I was capable of writing and directing. So that was all that was for, and it more than served its purpose. Not in the way you would think because... One Life Stand won lots of awards. It won uh, a, the BIFA for Best Achievement in Production. It won a whole row of BAFTA Scotland New Talent Awards. It won other bits and pieces here and there, but it also got great reviews, which was astonishing because it was only reviewed as part of festival screenings because it never went on release and we'd never intended it to go on release. We never ever sought distribution for it. But with Solid there... That was um, that was the start of us thinking, right, okay, let's parlay this into big grown-up filmmaking. So I started off with the script. Um, I'd had a couple of uh, suitors, if you like, in the shape of London-based production companies who wanted to uh, co-produce with us, which eventually and sadly didn't work out. Um, but we did approach the public funders initially for development funding and... That meant going to Scottish Screen, in our case, uh, having just won their first ever Outstanding Achievement Award and they knocked me back. <laughs> well, when I say they knocked me back, they only offered 60% of the money that we had requested as part of the development funding application. And I thought, well, that's not really good enough because we were not pulling these figures out of thin air. The amount of money that we asked for, which was something like 25000 which was not free money, I have to say, because um, a lot of people aren't aware that when you get awarded uh, development funding, it all has to get paid back and then some on the first day of principal photography. So we weren't asking for free money. I could have probably gone to the bank and got cheaper money. But um, in this case, we decided to withdraw the application because they simply didn't believe us. They didn't believe that when we said we needed 25000 to get us through perhaps... A year and a half, two years. I mean, it's no huge amount of money in the scheme of things, but you just felt this was in, this was in bad faith. They didn't want to give us what we asked for. Then we wouldn't take anything, and we just try and do it ourselves without them, and try to find a way of sustaining yourself in that time. And so, you know, going into this, we a really positive attitude was, you know, soon. <laughs> soon scrubbed you know I was soon quite disillusioned because at the very first the very first hurdle we were sort of set back a bit um, um, but what I did was I got the script up to a sufficient well a, a sufficient state of readiness if you like that I decided to approach distributors in London and one of the distributors I approached was Momentum uh, Momentum Pictures was like uh, they'd been responsible for other Scottish films that they had released, like Magdalene Sisters, and I think they did Lynn Ramsey's first film, Ratcatcher. And I met a really lovely woman there called Sally Kaplan, and she she really loved the script, and she says, look, we'll come in, and it'll give you a bit of leverage when it comes to raising production finance. And so, armed with that, we went back to the public funders and said, well, we're going to make an application for production funding. We're asking for the maximum amount, which at that time was 400000 About that time, we'd also approached the Glasgow Film Office, which was awarding production finance, and we secured another 100000 from them. So we were starting to get to a point where this was becoming very doable. And I'd always, when during the writing of the script... I'd always had it in mind that I had to make it at least doable, but it would have been really nice to do it on a much bigger budget than we'd had previously. 
for anybody who doesn't know about the film, um, the story of Solidaire is based on a true story. It's it's about my dad, um, and my dad, he passed away a couple of years ago, sadly, had suffered from asbestosis, and the kicker for me was um, I found out that my father, as part of, of his case to get compensation, had to find a witness to testify on his behalf to say that he obviously worked at this place at that time and my father was unable to come up with anybody because all of his work colleagues, every guy that he worked beside in the shipyards and various power plants and factories, they were all dead of, you know, of asbestos-related disease. And when I, I found this out, I thought, dear God, this is a story. Why isn't anybody telling this story? So I thought it was a great subject for a film. What I added into that was the aspect of gambling. And so what I came up with was a father-son story where the son was a wrong one who was up to his ears in debt. And he discovers, after being estranged from his father for a few years, that he had, his father is due to get a lump sum in compensation for his disease. The only problem is, is the case has been dragging on for years because his father has been unable to turn up a witness to testify on his behalf. So for me to equate the legal system around these cases with gambling was so completely opposite. I thought this this could work. I could really make this, this story work. So that's what that's what the film is about. That's the subject matter of the film. Um, and so going back to uh, Scottish Screen to try to raise the, the biggest part of that budget, um, it was really gratifying because having been not back for the development funding, we took it out of the hands of the officers of Scottish Screen and were fortunate enough for the script to be read by 14 individual people on the board responsible for awarding production funding. And unanimously, they agreed to give us the money. In fact, they offered me more money than I had asked for. And I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll manage, I'll manage. And that's that's how we got started. And how was the shoot? Was it an enjoyable process? <laughs> it was one of the worst experiences <laughs> of my life. No, I exaggerate. It, it was dark. Um, it was quite unusual, in fact, because we had a lot of problems trying to crew up for it. Um, bizarrely, at that time, because we shot it um, in the autumn of 2002, so we're going back a few years, um, there were, apparently there were five major dramas or films in production in Glasgow at that time. And so, you know, trying to get crew was, was really tricky. But we, you know, we managed to get a fairly good crew together. And um, one of the things that was important for me was I wanted to give people a break. So people who maybe had experience in short filmmaking or they'd done a bit of television, but who wanted to step up to a head of department role, I gave them that break. And that sort of led us into problems uh, of a sort because... In a feature film, generally, what you require to have a thing called a completion bond. Um, it's an insurance policy against some major disaster that the film does not get finished. And one of the conditions of uh, getting a completion bond uh, is to prove that everybody on your cast and crew is bankable in some way. So, for instance, your director of photography has to prove that they have experience direct, you know, in being a DP on another feature film, so you have to step everybody up. Um, we made quite a controversial decision in that we decided to forgo the completion bond, and partly um, because I just thought, that's a big chunk of change when you're working on a fairly modest budget, and I couldn't find anybody who could really fully explain to me why this thing was so necessary. And So again, this was me, it wasn't me deliberately kicking against the established system, the established way of doing things, but frankly, I couldn't see the sense in paying out so much money for something that we probably would never call on. So um, I guess I was being pragmatic in, in that sense. And how did you find the the change in tempo from going from a very, very small cast and, you know, sort of shooting from the hip and then going into something that's, you know, perhaps bigger and more daunting? Ah, but you forget. I'd already worked with, like, really big crews and commercial work, so I was kind of well used to, you know, that 
you know, that environment. Um, it was, you know, no problem for me to turn up and see 40, 50 people behind me as a crew. Yeah, you know, I was, uh, at least I was inured to that. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, is when you're, in, when you're doing a job, you're so intent, you're so focused on what you're doing. You, you, you tend to forget all the stuff that's going on around about you. you, you I'm, for me, I'm focused on, because I work out everything in advance, so I know what all the setups are going to be. I've had that discussion with the DP. Everybody knows what is happening. And the first AD is supposed to run it. And, I, and that allows me to focus just purely on the acting. And I can give all my time to the actors. And, you know, and make sure that they're really comfortable with what they're doing. And they, you know, they know what the shot size is. They know how far they can go. They know the psychology of that particular moment in that, in that scene. And how did it feel to watch the film in the in the big screen? Uh, I've I've never seen it on a big screen actually. I've only ever seen bits of <laughs> bits of it. The, what was also interesting about the whole baking of Solid there was it was one of the first feature films that had been uh, that had been acquired on high definition. Um, up to then, all feature films had been shot in thirty five mil film, sixteen mil film, um, but this was one of the first out out the trap. And uh, for a couple of years, because after I did um, One Life Stand, one of the great things to come out of that was I was one of the first recipients of a Nesta Fellowship. And Nesta is the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts. And uh, I was, I was um, nominated anonymously for, for one of those awards. And it, it was really great to get it because what it enabled me to do was to spend two years thoroughly researching the world of digital cinema, which at that point, 2000, 2001, was pretty much in its infancy. And I had really brassed my case shooting something with a three-chip camcorder. The, you know, the, the next step for me was how do I progress this in a viable form of acquisition for the big screen? What are all the processes involved in getting it to that point? And even then, because there was such, uh, because we take it for granted now when you go to cinema, the chances are you're going to be watching something that's projected digitally. At that point, um, very few um, cinemas were equipped for, for digital projection. And certainly none of the film festivals were capable of um, projecting digitally either, which meant, you know, that whole thing that happened in, you know, the you know, the, the mid-90s to 2000s, the whole Dogma 95 thing that came out of Denmark, this shoot from the hip, shoot on camcorders, you know, no lights and only natural sound was, um, well, actually the game was a bogey because there was no film festival that was capable of screening this stuff. And what Dogma didn't tell you is they had all this stuff transferred onto 35mm film, which was a ruinously expensive exercise on a no-budget movie. Very, very few people could afford that. Now you've obviously got quite a few accolades and awards. How does it how does it feel to have them? Um, well, I keep them in my shed. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got a shed in my garden where I keep these. I don't really bother about it. It's in the moment. It's it's really nice. But I think over the years, because I've had such a strange career to date, um, because since I did Solid Air, and which also went on to win awards, but not in this country, it was quite acclaimed. Um, in mainland Europe and in the United States. But again, um, even though I had a distributor, that's another story, it, it didn't eventually, cut a long story short, didn't get distribution for numerous reasons, which was really sad for me. But uh, it doesn't take anything away from the film. I know a lot of people who just adore the film. Um, I always feel a bit mixed about watching anything I've ever done. You know, I can't sit there comfortably and go, oh, it's, look at how wonderful. I don't, I don't do that. Um, I just want to get on with the next one. But the awards sounds really nice. I mean, there's no getting away from it. Who doesn't like awards? It was, it's, it, it, it's great. I remember, it was so funny when um, One Life Stand won all the, the BAFTA, the wee BAFTA awards, because I'd, I'd kind of got dressed up a bit for because I'd been tipped to wink that I was going to win something that night, but I didn't realise I was going to be up and down, up and down, up and down the stage the entire evening. And I think at one point I just sort of looked into the audience and said, I wish I'd worn flats. <laughs> but um, no, it's, it's nice, but it's, it's in the scheme of things, it's not important to me. What's important to me is 
what's the next story? What's the next thing going to be? What's the next thing going to be? So on to the next thing, Devil's Plantation. Ah, aye, Devil's Plantation. That was a kind of strange project. Um, it was, you know, looking back, it's kind of strange because. My first feature was done completely against all the rules, breaking all the rules. Second feature was we tried as far as possible to obey all the rules, but we still tried to innovate within that, certainly in the technical side of things. Um, I had I had to take stock after Solid there because it was a very dark experience for me in a lot of ways. You know, the subject matter itself about you know, guys with industrial diseases who are dying, and you know, uh, that was that. You know, it wasn't hardly um, a load of laughs. But during the making of it, ironically, my mother died. Um, she died when I just completed the first rough cut of the film. So again, it was like taking me in a dark place. But what I didn't know was that in two thousand and three, when my mum died, that that same year, Owen would lose his grandmother. And then the following year, he would lose his mother. And we went into a kind of tailspin psychically for a wee while, where we just had to stop thinking about career or work or, you know, ourselves and start thinking about, well, we have to kind of pick up the pieces of family and spend a bit of time on that. And as a result of all of these things happening in 2004, I moved from Glasgow to Edinburgh, where... Owen's mother had lived and she'd left behind this house and it was our job to clear it and that at the time I didn't know at the time was going to eventually lead to the project I'm working on at the moment but the devil's plantation was a strange thing after a couple of years of living in Edinburgh I thought I really need to be working I have to find something I have to you know I want to find something creative to do and uh, at that time, the Scottish Arts Council were running a thing called the Crepe Scotland Awards. And I knew that it was going to be the last year. 2007 was going to be the last year of these awards. I thought, if I don't pitch in now, I've got no chance. I will never get it. So I decided, after having considered it for a year and then going, nah, there's no way, they're never going to take me. I thought, I'll go for it, I'll go for it. You know, what's the worst that can happen? They'll say no. And I won. Um, to my astonishment, I got this uh, award of 30,000, which is, for an arts prize, is quite considerable. You know, it's, it's I think it's more than the Turner Prize, but nobody knows about it. And they've been dishing out this award to, I think they chose 10 artists a year. And I thought it was a bit cheeky of me classing myself as an artist, but I thought, oh, why not? I'm just going to go for this, as you do. <laughs> and uh, so I was delighted to get it. Uh, and uh, the proposal that I made to them was, in 1984, there was a guy called Harry Bell who had written a book called The Devil's Plantation. Uh, well, no, The Devil's Plantation. He'd written this thing called Glasgow's Secret Geometry. But his starting off point was a place called The Devil's Plantation, which is not far from where we're sitting at the moment. It's somewhere between Newton Mearns and Eaglesham in the southeast of Glasgow. And it's reputed to be haunted. And so I was fascinated by this book that Harry Bell had written. And so I decided to base a project on this. And one thing led to another. And uh, the Scottish Arts Council said, OK, right, you're going to do this project, but we're not going to let you make a film. I was like, yeah, what? I'm a filmmaker. What am I supposed to do? And they said, no, we regard architects and filmmakers as too commercial. So we'd like you to find another form to you know, beef a project on. And I thought, oh God, what am I going to do? So what I did was um, I proposed to them that I would make a website that was going to be interactive, that would take the journey that this man, Harry Bell, had taken to locate the secret geometry of Glasgow, like a kind of 10 pence Da Vinci code type deal. And so uh, they, they agreed to that. And I thought what, what I didn't tell them was I was going to insert 66 short films within the website. So two and a half years later, 4,000 miles later, um, a lot of coding, which I had to sort of learn from scratch, came up with this, this website, which told the story, not just of Harry, but of a character who insisted herself in this story, a woman called Mary Ross, whose case notes I had discovered when I made a move back from Edinburgh to Glasgow to do the project. 
And by that time, my husband had landed a job in Glasgow as well. So it made perfect sense for us to return to Glasgow in 2008, where, and I've lived here ever since. So we, we you know, so I'm working on this project and, you know, and it was quite challenging. Um, but Mary Ross had insisted herself and it, I, I found this, um, I can only describe it as a folder of case notes when I was moving house. You know how all that rubbish that you gather and boxes that you've never quite emptied. And I found this red plastic folder and it said, visits after discharge. And inside were the case notes of this woman. And I was fascinated because it seemed that she had been a serial abscondee from Leverdale Psychiatric Hospital. And I thought, hang on, that's at the bottom of the road where I grew up. So immediately, because of that association, I was fascinated. So looking into it deeper and deeper, um, I thought, there's a lot of coincidence between the places that she ran away to and the places that are cited by Harry Bell in his original book. So I thought, there's something in this. So she worked her way into my story because I thought her um, journeys in the city were chaotic, whereas Harry's were with a purpose. He had a quest. So I quite liked the idea of somebody making a peripatetic sort of journey through the city and this guy who was on a mission. And so the two things came together on the website, which I think is, is available as an app now. We did an app version of it. Uh, but as a result of that, in 2010, I won another small BAFTA award for best interactive category. And I think at first they were looking at me askance going, you can't apply for this. You know, A, you're not new talent, and B, and I was like, what's the B? And like, oh, but you haven't applied to be in the interactive category. And I was like, no, this is my first go at it. So I'm probably the oldest person ever to be winning the BAFTA New Talent Awards. <laughs> Ten years between them. And how did you find the solitary nature of, you know, just you out there by, you know, by your lonesome? I loved it. There's something really pure about just this idea of making a trip on your own and you've got a camera with you and you're just going to record exactly what you find there. And the and I, I got to the point where I just I liked it so much and I would meet really interesting people and they all wanted to tell me their life story or I'd get into a situation where I'd be in the middle of some graveyard and it'd be quite creepy and I was a bit, you know, <laughs> having the heebies. Uh, I, I just I just thought there's something about this I, I really love this I like being on my own I like, the, I like the solitude of it I like the novelty of going to places that I really ought to know I mean I've got to know Glasgow I thought I knew Glasgow really well until I did this project and then suddenly I go I've never heard of that that's a fascinating place or that little hidden corner of the city I loved all that aspect of it and it got to the point where I'd say to my partner I'd like oh and let's have a picnic and go on a trip so I can take my camera. And we used to spend like a summer evening and I'd say, I need to go to this place, but it's a wee bit far out. And we'd drive off to this place and I would set up my camera and then we'd have our picnic and I'd be really, just really, really happy. I really got into the whole sort of journey and, you know, making all these separate trips. I loved that. Sounds very peaceful, very therapeutic. It's great. It's a kind of therapy for me, yeah, it was lovely. And is there a particular place that you think it's worth well mentioning. Um, Don't give away your secret spot, though. No, no, no. I did actually solve the secret job. You see, the thing about um, Harry Bell was poor Harry died in 2001 before he'd managed to complete his quest. And so when I picked it up, and I can't take credit for this, but my husband's a bit of a mathematical genius, and we did work out the geometry, and we did solve Harry's mystery. We believe we have... A couple of people have since come to me and went, oh, are you sure about it? And I said, no, absolutely, we have solved. And it was in the most unlikely place, but I'm not going to reveal anything else about it. No. You have to go and find the film to, to find out. But um, other sites, um, I really like the Devil's Plantation itself. The Devil's Plantation is actually called Bonnington Mound. And if you look up an Ordnance Survey map, You'll see, I love ordnance survey maps because of these wee drawings and different kinds of font that they use. And if it's an ancient monument that's written in this kind of gothic script, that kind of stuff. And and funnily enough, since I'd, I'd made my trip there, I'd made several trips there, but I discovered recently that, I think it was in 2010, it was given ancient monument status, 
which I had never had before. So I don't know whether it was in connection with me doing the work or it was just a coincidence. If it was a coincidence, I'm all for that. Um, other places, Pollock Park, Pollock Country Park, or Pollock Estate, as I knew it as a kid growing up, there's a um, really strange vibe about some parts of that park. But there's a huge earthwork um, in the... Um, off the path on the north wood. It's in the it's in the middle of the woods, and they say it's a Iron Age um, ring work, and that's worth having a look at. I find it fascinating. You can go into the park in the middle of Glasgow, and there's Highland cows. Aye, it's great, isn't it? But you know, there's ninety four parks in Glasgow. I thought there was only ninety, and then somebody the the other week said, "Oh no, there's ninety four parks." So I don't know what the other four parks are, but. It's it's about a city like Glasgow, which was mainly tenement city, was uh, or high rise uh, blocks really needs those parks, and that's why they were established in the first place. So, Voyages, your your the latest project. Voyages, um, I, uh, I Voyages is um, it's a yet again another labour of love. Every time I do a project. I try to take something away from it and think, what did I learn? What did I like? What did I not like? And uh, But this, for me, is quite... Uh, well, it's long in gestation. It was, um, as I said earlier, it was a result of uh, the death of my mother-in-law when I had to go and clear her Edinburgh house. And in the house, I discovered a lot of things about this woman who I thought I knew. Um, I'd known her for 11 years, and... It turns out there were a lot of things that she was keeping quite secret and that was only discovered when we did the house clearance. And I began the project, I had a vague idea that I wanted to do something with what I'd found in 2005 and I wrote a treatment initially uh, that was going to be like a sort of conventional drama, you know, sort of story about old women who blah blah blah. Um, and over the years it evolved. I just thought... Nobody but nobody is going to be interested in financing a, you know, a film about a bookish old lady without me having to introduce some contrivance. Uh, I had to, you know, have a introduce a, you know, sort of eccentric lodger or whatever, you know. And I, I thought, no, I want to, I want to do something that will tell the truth. And the truth be told, it took a long time to get to the point where I knew what the answer to that question was: What should this really be about? Um, and it's only in you know the last couple of years that you know I'd started doing a lot of research after I'd moved back to Glasgow, I picked up the project again and looking into her papers and all the documents and things that she'd left behind, even the objects that she left behind, they were starting to tell me a story. So I began to research into all the things that the claims that she had made, looking into the places where she had lived. Or were, she was she was one of the women who in the nineteen fifties had the rare opportunity of going both to Oxford and to Cambridge to study, and she had quite an interesting life because she she was a ethologist she worked in zoology and biology, and she eventually did a PhD paper on the behaviour of song the parental behaviour of songbirds, you know it could get more obscure than that but. She worked with a guy called Nico Tinberg, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, who set up an experimental behavioural group at Oxford, and this was in the mid-1950s. So there were all of these little interesting things that fascinated me, and in a way it felt like a kind of detective thing. It was unfolding the more I, I sort of looked into it. And so it took me quite a long time, but eventually, two years ago, I wrote a screenplay based on it, only in her voice, I thought, I'm just going to have this thing narrated. My takeaway from Devil's Plantation was, um, and something that we never mentioned was, apart from being a website, I eventually compiled it into a feature-length film, which uh, screened at the Glasgow Film Festival three years ago. So that um, and that was a really good experience, and the audience really seemed to like it. They seemed to be quite hypnotised by it. I've never sat in the, and watched it on a big screen, but I'd really like the chance to do that because uh, it's something I've never done. But people came away going, that was that was amazing. So it was nice to do that. But in order to make that film version, I managed to get Gary Lewis and Kate Dickey 
two of my favourite favourite actors. In fact, Gary's been in all of my films today. It's just a shame he's not going to be in Voyageurs, but uh, maybe the next one, Gary. And so it was lovely to have them narrate it. And I just thought, this is a wee bit like radio with pictures. Something about it that's very compelling. Because at the end of the day, people just like being told a story. And if they've got a really, what they believe is a reliable narrator, they really want to go with that narrator and with that story. And so that was what I took away from Devil's Plantation to apply it to Voyageurs. Because again, I didn't really want to go down the route of looking for funding. I wanted to do something which was within my gift, you know, because I've got, you know, I've got the kit necessary. I've got, you know, I've, you know, I've got the ideas. I've got the script in front of me. All it would take is a half cost and the cost of getting somebody, you know, a really great actor to perform. I, I wouldn't say narrate, but more perform in the case of Voyages, the script. So, uh, so all of these pieces have been coming together um, over the last two years. And I'm literally about three or four weeks away from completing the film now. And it, again, another labour of love, two years in the making. Um, I've shot it all myself, I've edited it, I've done all the vis effects, um, I, I, I managed to get a wonderful actress, uh, um, Shan Phillips, who's now Dame Shan, sorry Shan, Shan Dame Shan Phillips, she was made a Dame while she was working with me, there's no connection there whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, but she uh, re she read the script. I got I got the script to her agent, and within two days, I just got the message. Shan wants to do this. She loves it, and she she just really loved the script. And so uh, I met her in Glasgow because, by coincidence, she was doing the importance of being earnest. She was doing a run at the Theatre Royal in Glasgow, and I was quite terrified of meeting you know a grand actress. I mean, she's eighty three. She is a force of nature. This woman. Her agent insisted that when I went to London to work with her, that I supplied a car and a chauffeur for her. And she said, nonsense, I'll get the bus. <laughs> I love her, I love her in bus. She was a dream to work with. She was really superb. And in fact, in her very first meeting, I noticed she just took my copy of the script out of her handbag, threw it on the table and said, I have a lot of questions for you. And I'm like that, oh, no. <laughs> have I got to answer this? <laughs> and did you get do you get nervous when you're when you're starting your work or during your um, work? No, because because I spent a long time working at the BBC um, and at Television Centre, and you'd be standing in the you know in the line at the cafeteria or at the bar or at a tea bar, and you'd be standing next to oh that's so and so and that's so and so, and you you became kind of inured to this idea of celebrity because at the end of the day we're all just flesh and blood. So I got that knocked out of me quite early on. I don't really get starstruck. Uh, but with Shan, there was just something about her presence because she's always played these really regal, quite intimidating ladies. And I think it was partly that that part of her persona. That, But we got on so well. In fact, she invited me to her house to rehearse because I said, oh, I can get a rehearsal space in London. No, 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 come to the house. So she came out. So she, I went to her house. She's got an amazing house. And, East London. and is her voice, is that is that the one that you, you felt when you were writing it? Oh man, I mean, I had, I'm going to be discreet here, I had two actresses in mind for the role of Erica. I call it a role, but I guess it is Erica. And it was also quite weird because of my long association with my mother-in-law. I knew what she sounded like. Um, and, and weirdly, I don't have a recording of her, but I just have the memory of the voice. And this idea of memory and hearing voices it has worked its way into the script for this thing. I know it sounds a bit strange, but you know it it does make sense when you see the film. Uh, trust me. And um, and so, out of the voices, because I, I I went I drew up a short list of actresses, uh, potential actresses for this. Um, and but I was finding it quite hard to get through at casting directors in London. I found there was a wee bit of an obstacle. So in order to circumvent that, I went to a guy called Frank Wazell, who's a casting director based in Ireland. I believe that he cast things like Game of Thrones, stuff like that. Um, and he was very obliging. And he said, well, there's only two actresses, really, that I would consider for this. And one was Shan, who was already on the list. And there was another rather 
starry, starry actress um, who will re remain nameless. And uh, I opted for Shan. Shan was the first person I sent the script to. And it was probably meant to be because she just came back with such a great response. I thought, fine, good, I'm winning. And we had a fantastic time doing it. And she she, she really was interested in, you know, we had a, quite a short time. We only worked together for a week. But I thought, what actress doesn't want to do this? Not because of my script, but what actress doesn't want to work in this way when, you know, you get an actress who's in her 80s. She doesn't have to get up at five in the morning to travel to somewhere to sit in a cold caravan to get her makeup put on, to get in a costume, to sit for three hours and then get called. It's just immediate. She doesn't, you know, she can come in her pajamas as far as I'm concerned, and so it was. And I think that aspect of it appealed to her. It was an easy thing to do. It was, you know, it, it was more, um, it was more adventurous than just a normal voiceover, you know, for or a narration. She actually had to perform, and her performance in this is astonishing. I mean, it's really the hairs in the back of your neck stand up when you hear the voice. She's incredible. How do you manage to maintain your vision and your passion from beginning to end? Oh, it's getting harder because I'm I'm not getting any younger. I think um, I think I've just had to come in accommodation with myself, Stephen. You know, we got this strange thing going on here where um, I'm at, in fact I'm just about to publish a blog about this because I've been keeping a blog for Voyages since October 2014, and. You know, reflecting on this idea of a career in the film industry is, you just think, oh, please, you know, we're in Glasgow. It's never, it'll, it can never happen here. Particularly if you really like living here, you want to be based here. I think if you really are set in a career, you have to go. There's just no way, two ways about it. You have to, not even to London. I think you have to either get to mainland Europe somehow or you have to get to the States or Australia or, you know, even South Africa has got a much bigger industry than, than the UK. And uh, regardless of what the, you know, what they tell you out there, there are certain films that I just don't, I cannot regard as being British. Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I, I don't call James Bond British when you see the way that the, the money gets put together or where it's all coming from or where do the profits go. You know, people say, oh, Harry Potter, the best of British filmmaking is owned by Warner Brothers. <laughs> Come on, don't tell me the profits are going coming back here. Uh, so this idea, you know, the stage I'm at, and you know, I'm a, you know, I'm fifty something now, and I think the notion that I can have a happening career as a, you know, action movie director, which is really what I want to do. I've always wanted to be an action movie director, you know, like the Bourne, Bourne movies. It's right up my street. Michael Mann, these great muscular male directors. Uh, that's where I've always wanted to be, you know. Um, but the prospect of that here is just, it's, it, you know, it's just never going to happen. So I, I've had to come to this accommodation where I keep my passion because there's always a story. And if you've got a story, then you have to weigh it up in your mind. You have to really be in love with the projects that you embark on because you generally you will live with them for such a long time and even in the scheme of things I've been thinking about Voyage U since 2005 and it's been through various incarnations in that time but uh, I came I hopefully I've arrived at the very best version of it that it could ever be with or without money because again I've been in a place where I've had to over the course of two three years find bits and pieces of money to make it and it's in the scheme of things, it's a very, very, it's it's a no budget film. Let's say, and um, the biggest expense was, you know, uh, casting Shan Phillips, and quite rightly she deserves the fee that she she got for it. But everything else has been, you know, reasonably cheap. Um, but in terms of a career, I just think find a story that you want to do, find a way to make it, and it needn't be a case of oh this is cinema povera, poor cinema. Um, this is, for me, it's a way of saying, well, let's look at the way that we're telling stories. Can I get the same story across, the same psychological space, the same emotional space, the same visceral sensation that, I, you know, 
than doing it just like a conventional movie. Is there another way of telling the story? I think um, I think we're living in really interesting times because we've got uh, media has been overtaken by you know the whole YouTube generation, the whole games thing, and I remember attending a BAFTA. I was on the panel at a BAFTA talk a couple of years ago about why can't we get women interested in gaming? And I said, well, I'll tell you why. Because the psychology behind the games is Neanderthal. You know, you've got to start making these things psychologically more sophisticated. And I think um, it, in storytelling forms, there is a way that you can do it as moving image. It's just how you do it. I mean, I'll spend anybody's money, don't get me wrong. But if I cannot get the kind of career that I naively thought I could 20 years ago in this country, then I will stay here and I will make what I want with what I've got here. Or come the, you know, if I ever get the opportunity, and I am considering it seriously at the minute, of getting out of Dodge and basing myself in the States for a while, um, and I'm seriously considering that for my next project, then that's what, if that's what it takes, as long as I've got the, the energy and the passion to do it. And would you like to do a high energy action type film if oh, you went over there? keep me away. I'd love to. This is Absolutely it. love to. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a massive surprise for me because I've pretty much seen uh, everything that, that May's done. <laughs> uh, and I would, I, I would, bet you're surprised. And I would never put you down as, as an action drama girl. So can you I would give, love to. So can you give us your, your, either your, your, your top three action films or your, your top, top three, three action, action directors? Um, well, I love all the Bourne films because I love... See, Paul Greengrass for me is, you know, coming from... He came from a current affairs background, using current affairs. He did World in Action, so he comes from that documentary background. And he did something amazing with the Bourne films. I mean, I just keep running in my head that car chase in Moscow. Wow. You know, that was incredible. Um, I'm trying to think... Um, Van Diesel. Um, I, I'm a great fan of Van Diesel. I think he's really good. Um... Let me think. I'll give you a mention in my pal Brian Larkin, even. Brian Larkin um, is a bit big, uh, it's a big plus in the Stephen Rowan show. And if you've not heard the episode, listen to it right now. Back to main action yeah, films, this is great. Yeah, um, I, because um, when Brian did the, the Nazi zombie thing, out, out, Outpost. I, Outpost 3, wasn't it? Yep. Um, I went to, he gave me um, some tickets to go and see it at Edinburgh Film Festival, and I went along to see it, and I just thought, oh, this is great. This is a hoot. You know, like, it's just, it's fun. Yeah. More than anything, you know, and, and plus technically I think it's fascinating as well. And that whole world of effects, which I've only just started dipping into recently, you know, after effects and trying to create different, you know, environments. Um and I'm doing it really, really sort of basic, basic stuff at the moment for voyageurs, but I think uh that's an area that I really could get completely lost in and, you know, invent whole new universes and, you know, Action movies in space. Oh, I'd bring it on. I'd love it. I watched an action film on Sunday night. Uh, what was uh, that? It's called 127 Hours. I've, uh, heard, I've heard of it. It's a secret soldiers of Benghazi. And it's two and a half hours. Jerry Bruckheimer film. Love Jerry Bruckheimer films. Aye. Just, Aye. you know, exactly. like, they all, all, all the senses. Yeah. But it's two and a half hours. And Armageddon. Was, Armageddon. And it, oh, yeah, Armageddon's, Armageddon's dynamite. But you know what's brilliant about Armageddon? It's got one of the cleverest scripts. The screenplay is just fantastic. But I think everything's in the screenplay. I mean, you've got the, the father's love for the daughter, you've got the guy's love for each other, you've got the fact that they're all trying to give themselves And I love that kind of blue bigger. collar aspect to it as well. Yeah. It's like the underdog guys. Um, I just love that. And it's like underdogs in space. There's a, there's a lovely scene where they're at NASA and Bruce Willis's character, Harry Stamper, goes, uh, I think you've called me because someone's told you that I'm the best. <laughs> I'm only the best because I work with the best. And then it goes into that lovely scene where you see we're all all the guys are and then they walk up and they're just like you know we're just you know we're just Aye. roughnecks that's right we're, we're here to do a job and yeah i mean uh, but there's a lot of wit in it as well there's a lot of really witty lines about you know like um the idea of like things going to the the, the lowest bidder you know these contracts for like spare parts and stuff <laughs> there's a lot of kind of wee in jokes and things love it and what would you improve in the action drama or what would you change um i would I mean, I don't want to. I, this is sound, might sound really glib, but I'd like to see a better role for women in action movies. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be right on here about all oh, sisterhood and all of that. But I just think that women are really poorly served by action movies. I really like. That's why I kind of liked the girl with the dragon tattoo. Some of the action scenes in that. I wouldn't 
necessarily describe it as an action movie, but it's a thriller crossover action -y type thing. Um, but the fight scenes in that were really fantastic. And I, I mean, I just love, you know, the, I love the whole look at it as well. Beautiful but, looking film. Well, I think the thing with the, with the girl with the dragon tattoo, it's immediately surprising because it's a female hero. Yeah. And when she's given someone a weapon, and she mm. does give some proper weapons in that film. But you don't expect it to come from a girl, and for that reason, I think it's more surprising. Like yeah. Generally, if you see a girl in an action film, it's like, you know, Roger Moore, like, oh, how do you kill three hours in real? And it's like, you know, it's a good-looking girl, which is a distraction, yeah. or it's there to yeah. prop up the male character. I mean, I stand in at sidelines looking mildly concerned. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think it'd be good to get more, you know, more girls giving people weapons in cinema. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's I'm what we need. That. <laughs> well, there's a there's a girl Ronda Rousey who's a, a former UFC and she's she's had a couple of action roles. UFC, a so. Ultimate Fighting Championships. Ah, right. Okay. So she's been doing some acting and she's been doing some roles where she gives you know folk, folk a weapon because that's what she's known for. And then there's another girl who is in a film and people will be screaming at the computer hopefully. But there's another girl and she's in a film with Michael Fassbender. And uh, it's a sort of spy thriller. But again, it's quite surprising because okay. she's given people weapons like they're going out of fashion. Uh -huh. So yeah, maybe maybe we need to get more strong females. I mean, I remember La Femme Nikita. Aye, aye, absolutely, yeah. I mean, that was I a great it. film, Bridget, Bridget Fonda. I was, uh, yeah, I was going back a bit, yeah. And then it yeah. got made into a TV series as mm -hmm. well, aye. Which, aye, was, which was fascinating. Yeah, maybe we need to see more of that. And maybe the future is the kind of box set serial type thing. Um, you know, like you're you're not trying to do it as as feature films. I think with some intelligent storytelling plus action, you could come up with something. And you're a fan you know, of the box set medium? Um well certain certain ones, um are, are exclusively American. Uh, aye, definitely. Um, in fact I'm a late adopter because I only recently watched True Detective for the first time, first season. Ah, oh, amazing. Absolutely amazing. But, um, you know, Better Call Saul, House of Cards, uh, you know, going back to even The Sopranos and The Wire, you know, um, I'm the proud owner of 87 episodes, I think, of The Sopranos when it first came out as a, as a box set. Have you watched Generation Kill? Um, um, I, I've seen, I think, one episode of it. Um, in fact, I think, is a, is a woman I know that was involved in that? Um, oh, she used to be head of drama, BBC Scotland. Um, Andrea Calderwood. Um, I think she was involved. She may be involved in that. I think that's been my phone for the last five years. I've never right. taken it off. Uh -huh. Yeah, just yeah. I, I banned the brothers as well. Um, when I was doing the post on um, Solid Air, uh, it was the same post house who did the colour grade for um, Band of Brothers, and uh, I remember you know watching some of it, going, "This looks fantastic. Looks amazing." Apple, Netflix, uh, what's your thoughts on the sort of digital marketing? Of I think it's a necessary corrective because, I mean, um, I mean, I have to, uh, right, okay, um, guilty as charged. I don't have I don't have Sky, right? So I, I tend to rely on them a bit more, subscrip subscription channels and stuff. Um, but what, what I see at terrestrial television is pretty, pretty poor. And I hate to say it, it sounds really disloyal to, you know, the traditional great British drama, but to be honest, I can't really talk about it because I don't watch it. So I tend to watch more American things than I do British things, to my shame. Well, I think if I went to see, you know, social degradation, then I can go and walk down a certain street in a certain neighbourhood. Abs absolutely. But if I went to see, you know, a story about guys going off to fight in Iraq or... World War Two, or you know, American political system. I can't go and watch that in the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think as well. Well, it gets back to the idea of um, you know your very first question to me, which was like, what was it like going to the cinema when you were wee? Well, when I was growing up, not every house had a television. It was that long ago, and I mean, we had a TV, but I remember it was an old. It looked like an exotic sort of cocktail cabinet. It was like black lacquer with a bit of gold sort of <laughs> gold paint round it. And it was black and white, and that's that was our television. So to go from this wee black and white box into like full blown Technicolor giant screen with fourteen hundred other people, um, I because if you want to see real life, you can look out your window, and that's why you know a lot of people have said to um, you know commenting in my work in the past um, about you know one one life stand. It was about a mother and son in Glasgow. 
it's all there, father and son in Glasgow, and they they see it as social realism, and I'm like that. I'd rather make social unrealism. That's you know, obviously you want to do stories that are intelligent, that are relevant to the world that we all have to live in, but I really don't want to go and watch something that's just like looking out of my window. You want to watch something that transports you, something yeah, that's escapism. Yeah, of course you do. Of course you do. And that's good coming from me. <laughs> you know, like sort of making films now where there's absolutely no characters on screen, as is the case in both Devil's Plantation and Voyageurs. don't think I'm giving much of a game away, but the stories are amazing. The stories, solid. The stories are fascinating. How do you think we can improve the film industry in Scotland and the UK? Um, I actually have come to the opinion, and I've thought about this for a long, long, long time, decades, that I don't think public money is helping. I think public money for film, it's not resulting in any better films getting made, and certainly not resulting in any better films getting on a screen, because no amount of public money can get your film on a screen. Uh, The whole system of development has created a culture, in my opinion, of entitlement, where there are a few people who uh, call themselves film producers who live exclusively on development funding because it's only when you go into production do you ever have to reimburse the funders with your development. Um, That's a disincentive to production. If you don't have to pay back development money, why would you ever want to make the movie? All right, it ain't much of a living. So generally, I don't think the public money is really helping that much. Um, and it's it's not hastening production either. When you talk about Scotland, I think what we've got at the moment is we've got a tactic by the Scottish government um, and by Creative Scotland, the board, uh, well, the, the body that's now charged with the disbursement of public money for culture and the arts and creative industries. The, the difficulty with the, the tactic, as I call it at the moment, is it's only about um, incoming production coming to Scotland. There's very, very little support for Indigenous production, people particularly above the line. By above the line, I mean people who are producers and writers and directors uh, getting into the business and making sustainable businesses out of it. The level of production, Indigenous production in Scotland, I'm afraid, is woeful. It's so low, it's negligible. We are lucky now if we're making five films a year, which can really be called Scottish. There's all of these films that are called Scottish, like Outlander um, as a TV series. Um, It's called Scottish and people identify with it as Scottish, but it's not made by a Scottish company. There's no lead producer who's actually based in Scotland responsible for that production. And you'll find that with a lot of films that wash up here, um, they will, or, or TV, high-end TV. And part of it is due to the system of tax breaks at the minute as well. Um, you know, Gordon Brown brought in incentives for uh, film and production to happen in the UK. And a lot of people between that and the exchange rate has has been an incentive for people to come here and produce. But I'm not seeing any of it really help grow a Scottish film industry. The rest of the UK will do what the rest of the UK does. You know, it's highly regionalised. You've got, you know, Yorkshire, I think, probably makes as many feature films a year as Scotland does. You've got Northern Film and Media that covers Newcastle and the North East. You've got, uh, the, you know, round about Liverpool, Manchester, they've got their own region. Um, Wales has got a quite healthy industry at the moment. Certainly Northern Ireland's thriving mainly due to Game of Thrones and they've got studio space there. And in recent years, what we've had in Scotland is an ongoing debate again, um, a long running debate about the viability of a studio. And there's been several uh, proposals over the years to build a decent four waller or a, a set of four wallers in this country. And I think, well, be careful um, if you want to get on board um, that kind of real estate bandwagon, because it's only as long as the tax breaks exist and public subsidy is there, um, that, you know, that that will continue. Um, If as soon as the exchange rate goes too far the wrong way for 
outside producers to come in if it's no longer viable, if they don't get their tax breaks and if they can't tap into, you know, half a million pound of public money out of Creative Scotland for their production, then, you know, I don't know whether or not they'll choose to remain. Can you explain to the audience if they don't know what a four-waller is? A four-waller is a studio. It's a proper sound studio which is insulated. For years, uh, people, filmmakers in Scotland have been, you know... They've been really clever in their use of um, extant spaces. They've been going into warehousing, they've been going into old factory buildings um, and they're basically converting them into studios. There was, uh, I think, at one time a studio or a place calling itself a studio based in Mary Hill that had a tin roof. Now, we are talking about the west of Scotland. We're not talking about, <laughs> you know, sunshine all year round. We get a lot of rain here. And what's the first thing you hear when rain batters off a tin roof? T or a, t t yeah. T t and for, so that's all right if you're if you're not relying on the sounds. But to have a proper four waller is to have. It's not just the space itself. It's to have all the services that are required. If you get a lighting company next door, a grips company next door, a sound house, you've got all of that infrastructure that you need to service that studio. That's what I mean by a four waller. So a proper industry. Yeah, a proper industry. You know, you know, studio proper. And I don't want to say a one stop shop, but a central location where you can pull all the resources. Yeah, and, and some can... locations are better than others. I mean, in previous years there was a scheme to set something in the Highlands, and um, you're thinking, well, that's all right if you're an American company who wants to come and shoot their exteriors in the Highlands, but if you want access to the cities then, you know, you might as well be in, you know, in Iceland and in filming there. Uh, and, you know, there's been various other schemes where, you know, studio complex has been proposed, but as part of that, there's been a hotel attached, uh, a retail <laughs> spaces attached, a golf course attached, and you're thinking, hmm, this is sounding more like a land grab to me than it is a viable studio for film and TV to take place in, who knows? And what about as far as education for the youngsters, whether it be how to, you know, write, how to express themselves? I think probably if you wanted to ensure a future, not that we've got much of a present, but if you wanted to actually try to grow a viable film industry in Scotland, the one thing you can do is invest in writing, and that's investing in education. Um, the only difficulty there is finding writers who are here now to be able to, you know, show, to teach how to do it. Um, and, you know, in the past, you know, not, not so much me because I've been involved in my own writing, but certainly my partner, he's gone off to look elsewhere for scripts. He's approached agents um, in London to say, yeah, do you have any screenplays that I can, you know, that the rights are available, let's have a read. And I don't know whether or not we end up with what's on the slush pile, but the standard of screenwriting in this country is woeful. It's really terrible. Um, and I, I, I say this as somebody who acts as a script doctor for other writers um, and, you know, newcomers and students. And people will often say to me, May, can you give me some advice on my writing? And I'll say, aye, sure. And then you read the first 10 pages and your heart sinks and you just think, oh, where do you begin to unpick, you know, the problems with a screenplay? And over the years, I mean, I'm talking about 30 years now, I've become, you know, quite expert at breaking down the script to discover where the problems, where the bodies are buried within that script, where are the flaws that's not making it work as a, as a viable story. And there's different schools of thought about, you know, approaches to screenwriting now. But certainly um, education, writing for me is, is vital. There's been a lot of money invested in recent years in skills, you know, whether it's camera or whether it's in the craft um, aspect of filmmaking. I'm not sure that that's really turning into long-term viable employment for people. And I think there is a tension here between the use of public money for subsidising content, as in, is it a film, a book, a piece of music, a painting? And... Um, this idea of a return on investment in film in recent years has been the only thing, the only uh, thing that's been funded through the public purse where a return on investment has been asked for as, as a condition um, of funding. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's wrong. I think it's wrong. I think that 
you got to decide what kind of cinema you want in this country. Do you want commercial cinema or do you want cultural cinema? And I think there's a big difference between the two. I'm not saying the two can't go together, but that's about as rare as hen's teeth. The planets will not align that often to give you a commercially successful film, which is also just great, you know, culturally in terms of its making or its production values, whatever. Uh, it's it's a hard one. It's a hard one to reconcile. I don't envy the public funders because they're having to... I think their remit's too large, actually. I think you should either concentrate on the whole education side of things as one aspect, the whole actual production side of things as one aspect, the whole marketing as another aspect, and I think that's been forgotten. Um, people are really keen to go out and make films, and they think because they've got a Facebook account, a Twitter account, that that's their marketing sorted. I'm afraid it's not. Uh, a few years back, there was a film um, called The Blair Witch Project, you know, that wee $60,000 film that... Watched it, yep. ...went on and grossed how much. I don't even think anybody knows the final total. Somewhere in the region of $150 million. And the story that did the rounds at the time was... Oh, but it was all organic. It was all done, you know, through the internet and people talking to each other and social media about yeah, this great film. And, and actually, it was not true. The reason that Blair Witch succeeded was it was picked up at Sundance and somebody decided to spend, you know, a hefty amount in p and to get that film noticed. And it was through conventional media. It was through newspaper adverts posters in the streets, you know, these billboards or bus banners, but that film was advertised through conventional media, not social media, and I think the same applies now. You know, big releases in this country, whatever big release means, 300, 400 screens, uh, you will still have the billboards in the street and you'll still have the bus banners and TV ads uh, advertising films. So it ain't that easy, and I think if... Um, I think there is a really good case for public money being spent in the marketing aspect of films that would help. If somebody was an aspiring writer, uh, what advice or what resources would you recommend to them? I think you just have to read a lot of scripts and there's so many scripts available online now. You don't have an excuse not to. Read the very best scripts. Have a look at, you know, if you're interested in a particular genre of film, well, look up, you know, the top grossing films within that genre and go online and find those scripts and read them because the worst thing that will happen is you will, you know, you will learn something. I mean, that's the very worst. The very best, you'll be inspired to go and write something and write something really good. But the, I, I, I think that's one of the best things that you can do. And watch movies, obviously. You know, watch movies because... What's always amazed me is that transition from the word on the page to what you eventually see in the screen. I remember going to see LA Confidential. Oh, aye. And it was a... It was, it was all shot in the wrong lenses, though. I never get into it because of the way it was shot. Did you not enjoy the... Um, no, I did not because it was... For me, it was all shot and it, it looked like it had been shot for TV. It looked to me that they'd sh they shot it on the wrong lenses. So it was all shot in like 35... 50 mil lenses where it should have been shot in 24s and 18s just to give it a different scale yeah just i it just it just looked very claustrophobic to me but maybe I'm, I'm wrong you know no 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 you certainly have a a further understanding in in cinematography than i do i remember watching the film and being really impressed with the dialogue and then i remember reading the script about five years later uh -huh. and just you know, there's there's something to be said for taking a film that you enjoy or even one I, that you hate, and then just breaking down the dialogue and yeah, thinking, absolutely. okay, well, you know, how how does that look in the page? Or how does it read in the yeah. page? And you know, at what point oh, I've got to turn it. Hi. Another, another um, good exercise is um, a few years ago I bought the rights to a really fantastic book. And we're talking about action movies, um, I, I bought the rights to a book called The Mysteries of Algiers, and. Um, and I, I wanted, because it's a kind of Marxist bond thing, it's like set in 1959, it's set in Algeria, it's about, you know, the um, the French pulling out of Algeria and it's about the war that went on there. And if you've ever seen a film, The Battle of Algiers, which is an amazing, amazing film, I recommend everybody to see Battle of Algiers. This was in the same territory and I decided that having never having never adapted anything before, I would I, I'd use this to adapt. And I did, I did an adaptation of it. And I remember at the time reading a lot 
of action movie screenplays to just get in that zone for writing that kind of really terse, um, you know, descriptive action or, or dialogue. And I remember, I, I can't remember what it was, but there was either, it was either I heard it in a workshop or saw it on some YouTube video about the best line of um, descriptive action ever seen in the script was about a car chase. And the whole car chase was described as the car's trade paint. And I thought, yeah, that's economy or what? The car's trade paint. That's excellent. That's that's, th excellent. that's a car chase, isn't it? <laughs> so I love that, yeah. Uh, okay, we're going to go into the quick fire questions. Well, I'll do my best. But you, don't need do my to best. Make, but you don't need to make them quick fire oh, answers. No pressure, no pressure. Okay, uh, fire. Okay, what should every 16 year old know about life and about themselves? It will get better. What should every 21 year old know about life and themselves? Uh, probably it will get better, but um, don't look back <laughs> too early. <laughs> I remember being 21 actually and thinking, oh, you know, I'm so old. <laughs> so I, it will get better, I think. I remember being 21, and in fact, it's like I remember buying a 21st card for a friend of the family, and right. they had this big key on it, and I, and I said to my parents, I said, what's what's the deal with, with the key? And they said, oh, well, when you're 21, you know, you, you get... The key you, to the door. You get yeah. a key to the door, you get the key to life. Yes. And then I can remember uh, getting to 21 thinking, well, my door really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I don't know if it was my 21st, but I remember being in Nico's um, when it was a trendy bar in Sucky Hall Street in Glasgow and there was a hairy guy sitting in the corner and he was kind of giving me the eye. And I think, I, I think, I'm pretty sure it was my 21st birthday. And I, I said to the staff, who's the guy in the corner? Like, oh, it's some film guy. And the guy shouts me over, he's like, you ever thought about being in a film? And I was like, aye, sure, aye, <laughs> yeah, yeah, believe you. And uh, it turned out it was Bill Forsyth, and he asked me if I would be interested in being cast in Gregory's Girl. And I went, no, I'm at art school. <laughs> I want to finish my degree. And I just, so I basically, um, I, I refused to audition. I was like, I've never acted in my life. <laughs> so there, there's a story, 21. I wonder if you would have been Claire Grogan. Doubt it. No, I would have been the other one. The other one. Okay, number three. <laughs> how do you pick yourself up when life beats you down? Um, knowing that it will pass. I mean, I think everybody gets to a place, don't they, where they, you know, you get up in the morning, you go, oh, why? Or in this time of year, because I mean, we're sitting here talking towards the end of October, and we were talking earlier about how you get a wee bit of the black dog at this time of year, and. Whenever I feel like that, I just remember what Owen, my husband, says to me, and he just says, it'll pass. It'll pass, even if it's really dark. I've been in places in my life where I just thought, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And and I have this thing, um, I don't know if I read it somewhere, but it's, it's quite wise. It's give yourself three days. If you're really going through something bad, give yourself three days. And I'm not a religious person, but that apparently was the time that it took for Jesus to be resurrected. But three days is seems to be a reasonable amount of time for you to kind of fully realise what, what you're in, how you're feeling, process it, and do what you can to change it, turn it round. But it will pass. No, it sounds... I sounds, used to work with a girl, and her mum was one of the happiest people that I've ever met. Like she was always happy whenever she would come in to collect her daughter. She always had a smile on her face and through getting to know her daughter really well, her mother had had some incredible hardships. Mm. And I, I said to her, I said, but you, every time I see your mum, I said, your mum's just like ecstatic and she's always got a smile, she's got a handshake, she, she's always very, very warm. And she said, well, my mother does this thing if something's upsetting her, she writes it down on a piece of paper and she puts it under her bed. Oh, Right. And because it's not in her head and because it's under a bed, she doesn't have to worry about it. She leaves it. it behind. And then when she gets yeah. up in the morning, she looks at it and realises it's not that important because she's not been thinking about it. But I love the three days uh, one. The that's three really, days that's ones. really interesting. I like the writing things down because I, I, I write a lot. Um, I've kept a diary since 1971. Well, like Mae West always said, you know Mae West, the actress, and she says, keep a diary because one day it will keep you. 
I like that. I love it. Is Don't there, mind, Will. <laughs> is there anything that you would like to share with people, a book they should read, a film they should watch, a place they should visit, an album they should listen to, something that will give meaning to life? Right, we'll start with the first one, a book. A book? Well, in recent years, um, and it's it's something that I, I read every so often, is a book called The Rings of Saturn, which is written by a guy called W.G. Siebold. And the reason I cite this book is because, well, quite apart from it being quite a fascinating book, it's, it's a book of non-fiction, but I find, I find it very transportative. Um, and I feel a connection to this because I actually have a signed copy. Um, I met Max Siebold when I became a fellow of Nesta in 2000, and I met him because he was made a fellow the same year. And Max was one of these people, he was a German, um, he was born at the end of the Second World War in a rural town in Germany. And he seemed to me, in the short time that I'd, I'd met him, was he was quite a troubled soul. I've read all of his work. And he was one of these guys, as a professor of modern languages at East Anglia University, was tipped as a shoe-in for a Nobel Literature Prize. Um, he died in 2001 in quite strange circumstances. I don't know whether he had a... It was reported he had a heart attack while he was driving his car somewhere in East Anglia. Um, and uh, the other report was that he crashed his car in a water bowser, which was on... But it was on an empty country road. And somehow I have this vision in my head of just this car stopped in the middle of nowhere with this dying man inside it so it's something that really touched my soul but it's called The Rings of Saturn and I really recommend it and the next one was a, a film they should watch film sometimes I get asked to do these my favourite lists and the film that I always say is um, it's actually three films and it's a trilogy of films by a Scottish director called Bill Douglas who sadly has passed away as well um, and he made these three films um, under quite difficult circumstances. They were all financed by the British Film Institute and the first part is called My Childhood and the second part is called My Ain Folk and the third part is called My Way Home. And I don't want to say too much but they're a really good study of a kind of certain slice of working class life in Scotland. They're set in a mining village and the, the wee boy who plays the lead in it is absolute revelation to watch. They're, they're just beautiful, beautiful films, being much appreciated um, internationally and haven't had much of a reputation in this country, but that's what I'd recommend. A place you should visit. A place you should visit. Do you know there was um, a thing on Twitter the other day, I think it was for Stylist magazine, about... Um, 17 places to go on your bucket list type thing and I went through the list and I discovered that I'd actually done 10 out of the 17. I'm like, That's amazing, I can't believe I've done 10 out of the 17 must go to places uh, that should be on your bucket list and I'm trying to think now quickly of um, all of all of the places, these amazing places that I have been and the, the brilliant things that I've seen. Uh, and it's really hard to kind of single out one because you know I've done the I've done the American road trip, um, I've seen the Aurora Borealis. Uh, I would I, I would love to go. Um, my husband spent nine months in India, and that's a place I'd always like to go, but I've never been, so I can't recommend it as a place to go. My favourite place in the world is actually in my bed. <laughs> That's fair enough. Holding on to my husband's. <laughs> well, I, I, j- j- but I don't want anybody yeah, else doing yeah, that. Yeah, I don't think anyone else should come round and do that. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, I know. I'm sorry. I'm not. No, 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 I'm not loving it. A, an album they should listen to. Album. I've really got a soft spot for the first Blue Nile album. Um, I walk across the rooftops because uh, they're a Glasgow band and. One of my one of my favourites, um, and there's oh god, there's so many. I mean, there's just so much music out there. Is Tinsel Town in the Rain? Is that a track in that album? Aye, that's right. That's just a beautiful song. They're, they're just they're absolutely gorgeous songs, and they've really stood the test of time. If you play it now, it just sounds like it could have been recorded, you know, two weeks ago. Fantastic, aye. So that and um, and also Hats is a great album as well. 
Um, other, well, I mean, because I, I like all kinds of music. I'm just, um, I, I just love every sort of genre of music that there is. Uh, I guess Miles Davis, you mentioned um, earlier on Miles Davis, and it's uh, kind of blue. It's just, you know. It's a real album. It's aye, a real album aye, from beginning to aye, end. Aye. I I used to do um, I used to volunteer at Sunny Govan Radio and I had a weekly show called The Cheap Seats which is a it was a program about movies and music and I remember playing a, a, a brilliant Davis Miles Davis track called Genevieve don't know if you've ever heard it I'll I'll play it for you it's absolutely stunning um I so a wee bit of jazz but I'm really a soul girl as well I love my soul music and. Uh, and um, album of the year for me, or rather last year, was Kendrick Lamar, um, To Pimp a Butterfly. Amazing. What I mean, a poet. Just, uh, aye, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. What book do you wish you'd read in your late teens? In my late teens? Um, oh, that, that's a tricky one. Because um, I'm trying to think where was I was in my late teens. Well, I was at art school. Um, I went to art school when I was 17. And I remember somebody giving me a copy of Jemmy and Greer's book, The Female Eunuch, but I never read it. Because <laughs> I, I, I just wasn't... Uh, I used to argue with all the feminists at the time. You know, because to me, all the feminists were... Uh, who, there was a feminist group at art school. And they were all about shutting things down or stopping things. And I was like, that, you're at art school, you're not supposed to be like... Create, sen open. Censor things, you know, you may be open. So I never read that book. Um... The one book that I, I I should have read then I might have been able to do something really good with it was uh, it was um, James Hogg's uh, the Confessions of a Justified Sinner um, which I think would be a brilliant adaptation as a contemporary story now uh, I, I don't want to go any further than that but that, that's a book I wish I'd read okay. when I was younger. What is the greatest act of kindness someone has shown you? Um, Oh, hands down, it has to be my husband. Um, I went through quite a difficult period in the early 1990s and I didn't know how I was going to get out of it. And um, I was really busy because I was working for a production company based in Soho and I was doing that really burning the candle at both ends. Um, I'd come out of a long relationship and it was a sort of acrimonious split up and um, I got really ill for a long time after it and I lost a lot of confidence. Um, and so when I met my then husband to be, I was uh, I, I was in a, quite a bad place, but he just really helped me, um, and he showed me the greatest act of kindness just by being there for me, and the greatest act of kindness I suppose for him was, um, I went to live in his flat, and he would come back from his work every night, and he would he would make me dinner, and. Um, this just went on for, I mean, I don't know how long it was. It must have been for a number of weeks before I felt well enough to move back into my own place. I'm nearly crying here. Um, and one day when he was at work, I found a note and it was a, a letter that he had received from, I think it was, I think it was Glasgow City Council. Um, they'd awarded him money towards making a film. And he had replied to them. I saw the reply and it said, I'm sorry, but I'm unable to take up the offer of the money. It's quite sad. Um, so he, he, uh, he basically gave that up for me. What a darling. What a sweetheart. What question have I not asked you that you would like me to ask you? Oh, um, oh, oh, God, my mind's went a wee bit blank there, to be honest, Stephen. Um, question? I think you've you've asked me just about everything. Have you not asked me everything? I think I have asked you everything. Well, what about, uh, would you like a piece of cake? I would love a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... You've been a lovely audience. Uh, it's been a real pleasure and a real surprise to, to spend the uh, time with me, Miles Thomas. No, thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Loved it. So, listeners, if you're thinking of doing something creative, if you're thinking about uh, expressing yourself, if there's something you're thinking about writing, then guess what? It's, it's in your head just now because you, you possibly should. So, go and open up a Word document right now. Get your notes open in your iPhone, your Samsung Galaxy, obviously... 
other uh, devices are available. But just, you know, it might be right, it might be wrong, but express yourself, get it down a bit of paper. If it's good, keep going with it, expand it. Maybe it's a feature, maybe it's a one-pager, maybe it's a poem, maybe it's a novel. No one really knows, but the important thing is just give it a bash. It's not for a certain type of person, and it's not for someone that's went to drama school or art school or university, whatever it is. Just express yourself, get it written down, meet some other like-minded people, and if all that fails, stick on some Earth, Wind and Fire, some James Brown, just have a dance. Anyway, have fun, it's your life, it's no one else's, don't try and be anyone else, and uh, have a good weekend, whatever you're up to. Alright, thanks for listening.